I want to start by asking you a question. And it's a relatively easy question, and it's pretty eye-opening. It's a question that I'm very glad that my friend asked me pretty early on in life. He asked me, how many of your decisions revolve around money? Now, me personally, I'm not a money is everything kind of person. There's a lot of more important things than, than money on the planet, for sure. So ultimately, what I'd like to say, I really would have liked to have said zero. Zero percent of my decisions revolve around money because, uh, you know, I, I make decisions based on the things that I care about and the things that are important to me and the things that I prioritize and the things that I'm passionate about. Those, that's how I make every decision in my life. But the reality of the situation was that I made probably about 95 percent of the decisions in my life revolving around money. Not just how important money was, but what was I doing to go make money? And how was I planning my schedule so I could go make the money? And what was I doing that could be changed by what was or was not in my bank account? And, and when I really started thinking about every, every tiny decision, I mean, we even just think about, uh, I don't know, when you wake up in the morning. Like when you're waking up in the morning, uh, I was waking up at 6, 6.30 every morning to go to work. Now, I don't know if any of you guys, who, who wakes up at 6, 6.30 in the morning to go to work? Okay. Now, do you wake up because your eyes just like... Man, I'm so ready to attack the day. I'm so refreshed right now. Or are you like me and, and you woke up to an alarm clock and you were, by definition, alarmed out of sleep? <laughs> and so, so you get scared waking up. And it wasn't necessarily because I wanted to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. It was because of the things that I wanted to do. I wanted to go to my job and, and do a good job there so I could get paid so I can live the life that I want. And when I... Woke up and I showered and I, I took a drive. I decided to take a drive in the morning and wouldn't you know it, everyone in Chicago wanted to go for a drive at 7.30. It was crazy. And I would sit in traffic with a lot of other people, not necessarily because I loved it, not because I wanted to, but because I wanted to get to my job so I could do a good job there and get paid and take care of the life that I wanted. And what I was doing during the day, what I was doing during the day, where was I spending my day, who was I spending time with, now, I know some of you guys, you go to work because you're, you're very excited and you're passionate about the things that you're doing. I think that's great. Me personally, though, my question to myself constantly was, if I stopped getting paid to be here, would I come back? And if I kept thinking about, you know what, boss, I think we're on the wrong page. See, I don't come here for a paycheck. I come here because I love you. <laughs> I'm not here for a paycheck. I think we're all wrong on this. And I come here because I love you, and I love my coworkers, and everyone creates such an amazing environment where we talk about so many amazing and enriching things that really change the world. And I am here because I love desk, and I love lamp. I love lamp. You know, that's, that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm not here for the money. No, no, I, I went there because I wanted to get paid, so I could do a good job, and I can get paid to take care of the life that I wanted to live. And, and every tiny little decision, when I ate lunch, and what I ate for lunch, how long did I take for lunch? What did I do during the afternoon? Who did I spend the afternoon with? When did I go home? What did I go home in? What home did I go home to? What did I do when I got home? How much time did I have with the people that I cared about? What time did I go to sleep? What did I do during the weekends and my time off? See, if there was a substantial amount of money in my bank account, and there was a sense of urgency. Here was the question I asked myself. Is there anything that I would be doing differently? Is there something that I would change? Would I change anything? And my answer was, I would change everything. There was a lot of things that I, I would rather be doing and it would change. But the fact of the matter was, I was spending a lot of my time and decisions revolving around money. And that was the reality of the situation. I'll tell you this, being young and free and being able to have enough ongoing income, we're not multimillionaires. We're not gajillionaires. We don't have fights at our home, me and Meredith, about uh, you know all of her $100 bills that are just laying all over the... Would you pick up your $100 bills for... You know, like that's, those, aren't the, those aren't the fights we have at our house, okay? We don't have money pouring out of every pocket. But I will tell you this, we have enough ongoing income where we were able to buy some of our time back and we've been able to make more and more of our decisions based on the things that were important to us and not make all of our decisions revolve around money. And I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't even know that life existed. I grew up in a go-to-school, get a good education, get a good job kind of household, and I thought that was the path to success, so that's what I pursued. And I figured, okay, well, if that's the path, let's get really good at school. So I crushed school, got really good test scores, all that kind of stuff, and I figured that's what should happen. So while I was pursuing that, I never, it never really sat well, though, to have my mom bankroll all my 
trips with my friends to Denny's, so I wanted to make sure I worked, you know, like I, I wanted to work and, and earn a little bit of money so I could enjoy my time in high school. So uh, the first job I ever had, I was, uh, I worked in an insurance office and I put stickers on, on folders and I put in data entry. I was 15 years old. When I was 16, I was a sample boy at a grocery store, which was quite honestly the best job on the planet. When you're 16 and you're hungry all the time, <laughs> it was me and the samples and about 40 grandmas. And... <laughs> And my boss was fantastic because she, she didn't give specific directions at all. So it was typically, Mark, here's five tubs of tapioca pudding. They need to be gone by two. I was like, I'm your man. You know, I'm that guy right here. This is the guy you need. This is why you hired me right here. Get some of this. When I was 17, I worked at a, a textbook warehouse. And I refurbished textbooks. And it was a good job. It was good, honest work. It was a manual labor job, and, and it was great. It was a great environment. They, they did us a lot of favors. You know, they wanted to make sure we never missed lunch, so they put a very large whistle to make sure that we didn't miss it. And then another whistle when lunch was done so we could remember to go back to work. Not that they had to remind us because we were so excited about it. But that, I, I, it was during that job, quite honestly, I remember. And, and it was, again, it was good, honest work, and it was, it was, uh, it was a hard-working job. And I would go, go, get up and I would go to work and come home and I'd be really tired. I'd be exhausted. And all I would want to do is eat and watch some TV and I'd go to sleep. And I remember going through that pattern after a handful of weeks and I told my mom, Mom, I can't do this anymore. And she's like, do what? What are you talking about? You've been working here three weeks. I said, all I do is I wake up and I go to work and I come home and I'm too tired to do anything else. So I eat and I go to sleep and I wake up and I go to work and I come home and I eat and I go to sleep. And I wake up and I go to work and I come home and I eat and I go to sleep. And she said, welcome to the real world. I said, oh my gosh, this real world is worse than the TV show. You know, like this is terrible. I don't, I don't want to do this forever. I remember thinking at that point, man, I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing to create income, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't having to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again for the next 20, 30, 40 years. And again, maybe that's fine for some people, but me personally, I wanted to really experience a lot of different things in life. And I felt like if I was in the same thing for the next handful of decades, I felt like there was a lot of things that I was gonna miss out on. And so when, uh, that was during high school, and then I went into to college and I was an actor and uh, I had paid my way through school being an actor. And I'm gonna tell you, I really loved that world. That world was great. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun because you got a chance to tell stories that you cared about and you got a chance to, uh, you know, in the collaborative process and, and really create something from nothing, which I, I loved. But probably the best thing I remember learning was at that point during those handful of years when I was an actor where no one hands you jack and no one gives you anything. You know what you develop? You develop a backbone. And I developed the backbone of an entrepreneur when I was an actor. And see, when you start to have a little bit of a backbone, you start to realize, I, no, I don't need to wait for someone to give me something. I can go make things happen for myself. See, at most jobs, at all the jobs I had up to that point, there was a specific progression. Okay, well, you go from here to here, and here's the next position. And in the acting world, there's, there's no set progression. It's a choose-your-own-adventure kind of thing. However you want to put your career and your life together, you can do that. And I love that. I thought it was amazing. And you know what? When you start developing a backbone of an entrepreneur, it starts bleeding into every other area of your life. When I was in school and I was a theater and education, so I did, did a lot of teaching and tutoring. And so when I would go to work and I was a tutor, instead of just showing up to work, you know what I did? I was just like, well, I'm an entrepreneur now, so I get to, let's go make some things happen. And instead of just showing up to my job, I figure, well, you guys don't have an after-school drama program, so maybe I can start doing that. And you know what? I did. And you know what? They paid me. And then when it came to summertime, and it was, okay, well, maybe let's just do some summer camps, and maybe I'll be a guidance counselor or something that, like that. But then I realized, wow, there's no art summer camps. Maybe I'll just start one. And you know what I did? I did it. And they paid me. And when we were submitting films to film festivals, there I, I didn't really know why all these film festivals, why do they get a chance to decide whether or not our stuff was good? How about I just create my own film festival? So I did. And we got paid. And it was amazing. And I started to realize, man, the world moves out of the way for someone who knows what they want and they're willing to do some work to get it. The world will move out of the way. The world will move out of the way and they will cooperate with you. If you know what you want and you know where you're going and you're willing to back it up with a little bit of work. And when you start to really understand that you can proactively 
guide the direction your life is going. Instead of waiting for someone to hand you something, instead of waiting for your boss to deem you worthy for the next promotion or the next raise, now it's time. You have enough experience. Now you can move forward in life. No, no, no. You can proactively determine where your life is headed. Man, it's the greatest feeling on the planet. It's unbelievable. I remember meeting a guy at a party once. Tall dude, really tall dude. I was like, dude, this guy had to have played ball. Dude, you had to have played ball somewhere. Where'd you, where'd you play? What'd you do? So I played basketball, high school, college. I was like, oh, great. Where'd you play? He said, Marquette. I said, Marquette's a, that's a decent school. That's not bad. All right. Did you get some playing time? He's like, yeah, I got some decent playing time. You know, I didn't start, but I got some playing time. We had, we had a pretty good thing going when we were there. I was like, pretty good thing going. When'd you graduate? Oh, four. I was like, ah, you were there when Dwayne Wade was there. In case you've been living under a rock the last decade, Dwayne Wade is of the last decade is probably one of the top five basketball players of the last decade, probably one of the top 30 of all time, MVPs, championship rings, all this kind of stuff. He's like, yeah, Dwayne Wade and I, Dwayne, Dwayne and I were roommates for three years. It's like, oh, that's pretty awesome. I asked him, what was your favorite memory of the time you were in college? I didn't ask him about, specifically about Dwayne. I asked him about Dwayne, like we're on first name basis. Uh, I, I didn't ask him specifically about Dwayne Wade. I asked him about, his, you know, what do you remember most from your experience there? And you know what he said? He said, you know, the thing I think about the most, Mark, I think about how every Friday night when the rest of the team, when the rest of us went to go party, Dwayne always went to the gym. Every Friday, like clockwork. He never missed a Friday. I said, that's probably where that $50 million comes from, huh? He's like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's probably where it comes from. See, you know what Dwayne Wade realized? Dwayne Wade realized that In a handful of years, I'm going to be a handful of years older. In a handful of years, I'm going to be considering to go into the NBA. And the only thing I can really control is how prepared am I for a few years from now. See, a few years is coming whether you're ready for it or not. You will be a few years older whether you want to or not. You are either moving forward with time or you are moving backwards by default. There is no staying still. If you think you're staying still, Congratulations, you're moving backwards because you're now two years older. You're three years older. And see, what Dwayne Wade realized was in a few years, I need to be ready. And I need to be doing what I need to do now to prepare for then. See, if you, let's say you're 25 right now. Do you realize that what you're doing at 25 actually doesn't really affect 25 much? What it really affects is 26. What you do now, what you do this year is the foundation that you build on for next year. And if This year is the foundation for 26. Well, guess what? It also affects 27, right? Because 27 is built on 26, which was built on 25. And so 25 is actually the foundation of 27 and 29 and 33 and 35 and 40. And see, what you do this year matters for the rest of your life. Is that overdramatic? Dwayne Wade didn't think so. Anyone who succeeded at a high level at anything doesn't think so. And it's funny, everyone understands that doing something now, preparing for the future, it takes time to build things. Everyone understands that when it comes to developing a skill, learning basketball, people understand that with their health, right? That's why you don't wait till you fall over and die. You take care of yourself. You exercise a little bit. You eat healthy. You take care of your car. You take care of your car. You change the oil. You do the best you can to make sure that it doesn't end up on the side of the highway. And you do the best you can to deal with all of these things. But when it comes to your finances, how many people proactively guide their finances? And when Greg asked me that, he asked, what are you doing right now to prepare for your financial future in a handful of years? I had zero answers. I had nothing to say. Because I I didn't even realize how powerful this year was. This year matters. This year matters immensely. So if you're going to be proactive with your finances, here's what I'd recommend. I think you need to start here. I think you need to get start. You need to start by being very honest with your current situation. What is the reality of your world right now? The reality of your situation. Because I know everyone's got big ideas of what they want to accomplish in the next five years and 10 years. And you're living out this amazing fantasy world in your lifetime. I grew up with parents that every year they kept saying every year it was tight. And every year they kept saying, well, next year it'll be better. Well, next year it'll be better. Anyone ever hear parents that, you know, that said that or you've heard people say that? But here's the question. What are you doing different to create different results? If you don't do anything new, nothing new will happen. 
And when I started really looking at the, the, the reality of my situation, I remember hearing someone say, the best way that you can honestly, genuinely be real about where you're going to be in five to ten years, look at what you're doing to create income now, and look at someone who's been doing that five to ten years longer than you, and that's most honestly where you're going to be. That's the kind of income you're going to have. That's the kind of lifestyle. That's the kind of control. That's the kind of family life. That's, that's what you're going to have, more likely than not. And the second I heard that, you know what instantly came back to my head? I remember the, the last show that I ever did um, as an actor. The last show I did, it was, it was with San Francisco Shakespeare Festival. It was their holiday production of Aladdin. I was the genie. It was awesome. And so I remember being in the dressing room. And the biggest name in that show was a guy named Jeff. And Jeff was a great dude. In, in the Bay Area, he was a local legend. I mean, phenomenal guy. Had done stuff, tours, off-Broadway, on-Broadway. He actually originated one of the roles in the original Lion King. I mean, just unbelievable stuff, okay? And I remember the first time I ever met Jeff, I was like, I would love to have this guy's career. Have you guys ever done that? You get to, you know, you find people that are maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and you, you're just like, man, I'd really like to go down that path. And I remember thinking that in my head, and so I constantly was studying this guy. But the second they said, 5, 10 years from now, look at, look at what they have, but it's a whole package. It's not just a, in the, the, the acting world about the fame and how many people know you. The reality of my situation was this. I remember being at that dressing room, and he had a son that was a little bit younger than me, just starting college, and you know what he said? Man, he got, he got a message on his phone and he said, man, my son needs another 200 bucks. Where am I going to come up with that? That's all he said. But I never forgot it. Because the reality of my situation was that if I kept going down this path, no matter how much I could keep deluding myself, no matter how much I could tell myself that that's, well, that's not going to be me. That's not going to be my situation. When you look five, ten years ahead and maybe your boss or your boss's boss and, and maybe they don't have the kind of time with their family that you have. But no, 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 me, I'm going to be in a different spot. No, that's exactly where you're going to be. Because the ladder that I was climbing, and quite honestly, if you have any amount of ambition and forward thinking, you're climbing a ladder right now. You're, you're wanting to move forward. You're progressing in life. You're trying to progress in life. So you're climbing a ladder right now. But the problem was, I was climbing a ladder that was leaning up against the building that I didn't even want to be on the top of. I didn't want to be at the top of this building. I didn't want to be at the top of this ladder of success. And if you really, honestly, genuinely look at where you're going in the next handful of years based on what you're currently doing, the question is, do you want that lifestyle? Do you want that package? And for me, I didn't. I wanted something different. And so if I had to get honest with myself, if I kept climbing that ladder, guess what I was going to have? I was going to have those exact same results. So instead of just changing the ladder I was climbing, instead of jumping off and you know finding another building that I could put my ladder up against, you know what I figured? I didn't want to climb someone else's ladder. I didn't want to climb someone else's building. I wanted to build my own building. I wanted to build my own building brick by brick if I needed to, because at least when I got to the top of that, I could get in my own building, go to the penthouse, and I'd be living large in a building that I created, in a life that I wanted, having a view and seeing life in a way that meant something to me. That was what was important. And see, unless you actually re, uh, you take a second to analyze and think about what's the reality of your situation, there's no way that you're going to be able to do that. And so I recommend you, you do build your future. You do b d build it brick by brick. But th here's the problem. Most people have no idea how to do that. And when they do try and figure it out, they're like, I, I do want to take more control of my future. I, I do want to do something today that builds something for tomorrow. There's typically one of three options that they go to. Why? Because that's what everyone has been doing for a long time. And the problem isn't necessarily either of these three options. The problem is that everyone's been doing these three things for so long, no one stopped to question, does it still really work? Does it work like you want it to? Is it going to accomplish the things that you actually want it to accomplish in your life? My favorite question is the word why. It's not my favorite when little kids ask me why, because that just gets annoying. Um, that's, that's actually why I, I moved from elementary education to secondary, because I just couldn't deal with, I needed them at some sort of level of competency and, you know, I, I need to be able to talk to you. Um, but little kids, they'll ask you why till you, you are, you're in the fetal position in the corner. Like, they will break you. They will break you until you answer their questions. 
But I think, I think adults would be very well served to ask themselves why every once in a while. See, when people are starting to think about building their future, they want to take a little bit more proactive control of where their future is headed. You know what the, the first major thing that most people go to? Well, how about I just get a degree? How about I get an advanced degree? How about I add more degrees on what I want to do? But let's ask yourself this question. The question is why? Why do you want to go get an advanced degree? Well, because, you know, it'll, it'll be good. It'll give me more opportunity. Okay, well, why? Why do you want more opportunity? Well, so I can go continue to advance in my career. Why? Because I want to be able to accomplish more. Why? Because at the end of the day, I, I, I want the best for my family, and I want to get there as fast as possible. See, why most people start doing the degrees and advanced degrees and degrees on top of degrees is because for a long time in this world, in this country, that was the fastest way to accelerate your ability to increase your lifestyle. That was the fastest way to accelerate the, your ability to provide for your family. That was the fastest way to do it. But here's the reality of the situation, the reality of that situation. Let's do some math. When I was looking into some different grad schools, on average, it obviously it depends on what school and what kind of advanced degree you want, but let's say you're getting your master's. Let's say you take two years, you get your master's, and it costs you about 50 grand to do it, okay? 50 grand, two years. Now, here's what most people do. Most people, they're getting their advanced degree so that they can make more money at their jobs, right? Now, I know some people, they just want to pursue the education, and that's totally fine. If that's why you want to get your master's, I think that's fantastic. But most people getting their master's, if you took out any potential pay raise out of the, equa out of the equation, do you think a lot of people would still get it? Very few, precious few. If you took that out, very few, I believe. But let's, let's say that, you know, on average, maybe what? An extra fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000 a year. Let's say $20,000 a year. So you, you spend fifty grand. you take two years to go get your master's. Well, then you have a $20,000 a year pay raise. Congratulations at the end of the two years. But the problem is that's not take-home money. What you take home is about twelve, thirteen thousand $13,000, right? And so twelve, thirteen thousand $13,000 is about a thousand-ish a month. And so now you're doing that, but now you have fifty thousand dollars worth of loans. And let's say you just took that twelve grand, and you just paid off your debt. Most people don't. Most people start spending more than they, they you know, than they're making, and they're starting to make a little bit of payment on their loans. But let's say you just took all of that, and you took four or five years and cranked out all your loans. So it took you two years to get the degree. It took you five years to pay it off. So now you had to wait seven years, seven years before you could enjoy a thousand dollar a month pay raise. You have to wait seven years before you can enjoy a thousand dollars a month. Now, if we're talking about accelerating through life, because that's why you wanted to do it in the first place, if there's a faster way to create an extra thousand dollars a month, don't you think that might be a better option? Here's the second thing most people do: they're trying to build their future to make every year count, so they start investing. Is there anything wrong with investing? Absolutely not. I think it's it's great. It's smart. But if you ask people why, why are you investing? Well, I don't want to have all my eggs in one basket. Okay, why? Because it's, it's dangerous. It, it, it doesn't make any sense to just have one stream and one source of it. Oh, yeah, that's totally sure. I completely understand. But why? Well, I, I, want to have an, I want to have income that comes in with, you know, out me working. Yeah, yeah I, want, I want to be able to have enough income coming in where I don't have to keep going out and working for it. Isn't that the idea of investing? But here's the reality of the situation. One of my friends, his name's Dave, he uh, worked on Goldman Sachs on Wall Street, and he was in wealth management for J.P. Morgan. So he handled investments for high net worth individuals. And, and I asked him, what, Dave, what's a safe kind of investment? What, what kind of return is predictable and safe? And you know, he said, probably about 3 to 5%. I know people chase a lot of bigger stuff. But uh, what's safe, if you're doing it right, maybe 3 to 5%. And so I asked him, if, so if you're trying to create an extra $50,000 a year of ongoing income, where you don't touch the principal, you have 50 grand a year of ongoing income, the math on that, the reality of the situation is that you have to put aside $1 to $1.3 million before you can start seeing an extra $50,000 a year return. Now let me ask you a question. At your current rate of savings, <laughs> let me ask, let me ask the, the, the question here, okay? Mark, at your, at your rate of savings, when you were start, starting to build your life, at your current rate of savings, when you were starting to build your life, Mark, how fast would you be able to accumulate $1 to $1.3 million? 
in savings that I didn't touch. And I was like, that would be about the seventh of never. Like, I would, ne- I would, I just, when I was being honest, like, there's just no way that that was going to happen. If you want to have a hundred thousand dollars a year of ongoing income, fantastic. Well, that's, you know, 2.2 to 2.6 million dollars that you have to have put aside. But ultimately what they want is, is the ongoing income, right? Well, what if you can have ongoing income without having to wait 40 to 50 years to be able to accumulate that kind of return? Here's the third thing most people do. If they want to build their future and proactively guide where their future is going, they want to start a business. They want to start a business. And I think that's phenomenal. Being an entrepreneur is the best thing on the planet. God bless America. That's why everyone's here, right? You want to take control of your future. Because when you get down to it, if you keep asking why, well, why do you want to start your own business? Well, I hate my boss. Okay, I understand. But, but you know, why are you starting your own business? And what it always boils down to, you keep asking the question why, they want to have more control. Listen, being in control is huge. Do you understand that if you're not in control, what happens if you get one phone call? Right now, you pull out your phone, your phone's vibrating, and you look at it, and it's your boss. Does instant happiness or instant fear come over you? And they leave a voicemail. And this voicemail says, um, Brian, I'm going to need you to come in about 30 minutes early on Monday. Instant joy or instant fear? You are terrified. And listen, if one phone call could rock my whole world, one phone call from my boss could create that kind of fear and that kind of instability, I was doing something wrong. That's not the building I wanted to be on the top of. That didn't sound like anything I was in control of. My friend Chris, who started his own flooring business, it cost him $250,000 to start up. And he had the startup cost, but then he also grew it, and it grew really well, and he had 15 employees, something like that. And and so their ongoing monthly expenses, $17,000 a month of overhead, and so when I asked him to do the math, Chris, what, what does it take to bring home your first $1,000 in your own business? He did the math for me. Well, the average markup between, you know, on labor and products and all this kind of stuff is about 25%. So if I sold $80,000 worth of stuff in a month, we'd see 20. 17 would go to overhead, so that leaves three. I had two other partners, so 3,000 divided by three people is $1,000. So I would have to sell $80,000 worth of flooring to bring home my first one to my family. See, that's the reality of the situation. And you know what? That story ends great. He did a great job. He built it, and he he crushed it. It was awesome. But that kind of, what if you could have that kind of control but not have to deal with that kind of liability? Well, wouldn't you know it? A handful of families decided to ask that question about 50-plus years ago. How do we have all of the benefits of those things but very few of the risks? And they created an opportunity and a platform called Amway. And when you know Amway's done a phenomenal job over those last half century, what they've done and what they've accomplished is unbelievable. I mean, 11 plus billion dollars in sales. I'm not even exaggerating. I know I've talked about gajillion and all this kind of stuff. No, no, no. Legitimately over 11 plus billion dollars worth of sales last year. In last year. Last year. One year. Uh, They've got a phenomenally high Better Business Bureau rating. They have partnerships with the most well-respected companies in the world. They have sponsorships with uh, charitable organizations and sports teams and sports organizations that have basically made Amway a household name. But what they've done for us is nothing short of amazing. As an entrepreneur, you know what they've done for us? They have our back. And when I say they have our back, here's here's what that means. Because if let's say you're playing basketball and you're watching the team in front of you play and, and whatnot. And you're, you hop on a team and you're about to play some pickup basketball. And you saw this little scrawny dude that missed every shot, contributed nothing to the team. He's like, hey, listen, dude, welcome to the team. I got your back. Does that really mean a whole lot to you? Are you just overwhelmed with joy? You're like, oh, thank you. I'm glad that you have my back. That's phenomenal. But if you're going to play a pickup basketball game, And on the court is someone like Michael Jordan or LeBron James or Kevin Durant. If Kevin Durant comes up to you and says, hey, listen, man, I got your back. Does that mean something? That means a whole heck of a lot. Do you understand when Amway has our back as entrepreneurs? That's like Kevin Durant saying that I have got your back in this pickup basketball game. Because anything that I'm trying to do gets multiplied by Kevin Durant. 
Anything that I try and do as an entrepreneur gets multiplied by what Amway has done, the infrastructure they've created, the platform they provide. They've taken care of all the products and the partnerships, and they've taken care of all the logistical mumbo-jumbo it takes to start a traditional business. You know what they left us? They left us the fun stuff. They left us the creativity. They left us the ability to be a creative entrepreneur and and have our own ambition and go create things that are awesome. Where the rubber meets the road, we're the ones that bring the business to the table, which is the fun stuff about being an entrepreneur in the first place. And we can live our lives and do the things that are important to us and build a business of our own all the while. And my favorite part about this whole opportunity was the fact that I was already doing it. I didn't even realize I was building this business. I didn't realize how much business I was driving to everyone else on the planet but me. I didn't include myself in any of that profit. And I was giving it to everyone else. Uh, you rem- do you realize, you guys have seen movies that you are just a, a huge fan of and you're telling everyone on the planet, right? Everyone's got a couple of those movies and you're telling everyone they need to go see it. For me, the last Batman trilogy was amazing. I went multiple times and multiple times in the theater and every time I went back, I brought a new friend. Now, did they make a little bit more money because of Mark Nathan? Absolutely they did. But do you think the directors and the producers showed up to my house with their checkbook even though I made them more money? Do you think they showed up in my house to write me a check do you think batman showed up to my house with his checkbook and said hey mark listen listen i know what you've been doing and i like it and you've been making me real rich so uh i'm gonna cut you a little check give you a little some of this profit because i roll deep because i'm batman you know like that's that's never going to happen ever in the history of the world never will that happen But did I bring a lot of money to them? Absolutely I did. You know what what Amway does? They just keep track of all of that. They keep track of that in a way that is through my own business as an entrepreneur for myself, and they cut me in on some of the profit. And when I was explaining all the things that they do and all the things that we have to do to build our business, how much Amway has their back, you remember my friend Chris that built his multi-million dollar flooring business? When I told him that, you know what he said? Mark, this is the best kept secret on the planet. I said, Chris, it's not a secret. It's an $11 billion company. (laughs) The problem is, Chris, because you had heard of Amway before, right? You kind of knew the name. You knew a little bit about it. He said, yeah. He said, the problem, Chris, you had partial information from someone who had incomplete information in the first place. They had no idea what they were talking about. They had no idea what this really was. And you took their thoughts and their opinions and you made it your own. This isn't a secret. It's been around forever. And quite honestly, I love that more and more people are really starting to understand what this can do for their future. And when you really start thinking about where the future is headed, where you start, when you start thinking about all the things that are coming down the pipeline, I think you are in the best place at the best time in the history of the world. And I'm not even trying to exaggerate. Generations before us would be floored at how much opportunity that we have. With the amount of technology and the amount of opportunity that's going on this planet right now is unbelievable. There's a guy named Mr. Samani. I want to tell you a quick story. Mr. Samani was, was one of the seventh grade social studies teachers at my junior high. In his seventh grade social studies class, ran for his entire year, they ran almost like their own little world, their own little economy within their class. They had their own currency. Everyone kind of ran their own business within, you know, within this class. And so people were doing business with each other and learning how commerce works and learning how being an entrepreneur works. But do you know why Mr. Samani was so passionate about teaching the next generation about entrepreneurship? Because about 40 years earlier... Mr. Samani had one of his acquaintances, one of his friends, come up to him and said, Mr. Samani, I don't think he actually called him Mr. Samani, but I don't know Mr. Samani's first name. (laughs) Mr. Samani, listen, I've got an idea that I think is going to be awesome and I think you should be part of it. And you know what Mr. Samani said? Well, tell me a little bit about it. He said, I think that people are going to want food. Okay, yeah, I'm following. I got you. Food. But they're going to want to go to restaurants. Yeah, restaurants exist. So is this a restaurant? Well, they were going to want food, but they're going to want the food fast. Like, okay, so they want fast food. Yeah, yeah. And not only that, but they're going to want to drive to this place, and they're not going to drive to the restaurant, they're going to drive through the restaurant. And Mr. Samani looked at Ray Kroc, who founded and franchised McDonald's, and said, Ray, I don't think your business is going to work. And he turned down the opportunity to franchise McDonald's throughout the Chicagoland area. Now, what I love about Mr. Samani 
is that he spent the next 40 years trying to teach other young entrepreneurs how to not make the same mistake. I think that's wonderful, and I think that's amazing. But I think he could also teach young entrepreneurs from the platform of owning every McDonald's in Chicago, (laughs) which I think would probably be his preference as well. Let me ask you a question. The reason that that's such a funny story is because you look back now and you realize, oh my gosh, of course that's where it was headed. Of course that's going to be huge. Of course that's going to be big. Let me ask you one simple question. How many of you buy stuff online? How many of you guys have bought stuff online in the last handful of years? When your kids are your age, how many of you think your kids will buy more stuff online or less stuff online? More More. Okay. So you all know it's going to happen. You know that e-commerce is going to turn into a trillion plus, plus, plus dollar industry very, very shortly. Here's the question. What are you doing about it? Are you the next Mr. Samani? I don't need a gigantic slice of a trillion dollar pie to be happy. I'm not greedy. I don't need a big slice. I just need a little slice of a trillion dollar pie. That's a few crumbs. That's all I need. I ain't crazy. But here's the question. You know it's going to happen, so what are you doing to prepare for it? What are you doing to set yourself up? Because there is no no shortage of opportunity on this planet. The only question is, are you going to do something about it? And are you going to do something about it now? Not tomorrow, not next year, not when you're 30, not when you're 35. How about this year? Because this year is the foundation for next year. I think this generation is going to be the most profitable and the most productive and the most impactful generation in the history of this world because of the opportunity that we have. But if we don't do anything with that opportunity, what does it even matter? I think there's two things that are going to stop this this generation from being the best generation this planet has ever seen. The first thing, it's called the someone else syndrome. Do you know what most people are busy doing right now? If they want to go to a restaurant, you know what they do first? They don't go try the restaurant. They don't go into it and order something and try it for themselves. You know what they do? They go on Yelp. And they figure out, well, who who likes this place? How many good reviews has it gotten? I know I walked by it and I really wanted to go in, but I had to pull out my smartphone to see what Scatman17 had to say about (laughs) about this restaurant. I don't know this person, but they're dictating what I'm doing with my life. You want to go see a movie, you see a trailer, you think it's awesome, but before you go to see it, you pull up Rotten Tomatoes and you're like, well, what do the critics say and what do the fans say? Who cares what they say? If you want to go do it, go see it. If you want to try the restaurant, go try it. Since when is making a mistake worse than letting someone else think for you? Since when did that become worse? Most people, before they try anything new, whether it's a restaurant or it's a movie or it's an opportunity to move their life forward, you know what they do? They ask everyone else. They're so busy trying to keep up with everyone else, they forget to be original. You're so busy trying to keep up with everyone else, you forget to forge your own path. This world doesn't need more people like everyone else. This world needs more of you. But you can't be you if you're filtering you through everyone else. Does that make sense? No one cares what Scatman17 has to say. Whose opinion is the most important opinion in this world? Yours or someone else's? Yours. Your opinion is the only one that matters. So put yourself in a position where you can make the best decision possible. Because just like I don't want you to listen to Scat Man 17, I don't want you to listen to me. Because I'm someone else and I'm not living your life. But I think you need to put yourself in a, the best position for you to make the right decisions for your future. Does that make sense? Here's the second thing. It's this delusion of passion. And you hear enough people say, well, you just got to find a job that you love. And then you're never going to have to work a day in your life. And you know what? That's great advice if you want to have a job. But what if you don't want to have a job? What if you don't want to work for someone? What if you don't want to have that kind of structure? Listen, I'm not about being miserable, but the goal isn't to find a job you love. The goal is to create a life that you love. The goal is to live a life that you love. See, most people, they've gotten, they've gotten focused on the wrong things. They think the process is what you have to be passionate about. I don't agree. I think you need to be passionate about the results. You don't get passionate about the process. Everything's boring at some point. Everything's monotonous at some point. Nothing's 100% brilliant and amazing. 
If you're waiting for something to be brilliant and amazing, you'll never move forward in life. You'll never be married. If you're waiting for things to be per, you're, if you think everything is going to be amazing and awesome and I'm going to be passionate about everything in the world, you're faking yourself out. Meredith went to a, went to a, a, a writing workshop with one of the most award-winning playwrights of this generation, a guy named Tony Kushner. And you know what someone asked him? He said, they, they, they asked him, Mr. Kushner, what do you love most about writing? You know what he said? Are writers pretty passionate? Are people in the arts pretty passionate? Absolutely. You know what he said? I don't like writing. I like having written. He liked the result of writing. He liked having produced something. He didn't like the process of writing. He liked the results of writing. You want to hear another quote? Every accomplishment, big or small, has stages of drudgery and stages of triumph. It has a beginning. It has a struggle. And it has a victory. You know who said that? Gandhi. You think Gandhi was pretty passionate? You think Gandhi lived with some flair and with some heart? But even he said, stages of drudgery. Does that sound fun at all? Drudgery? Does struggle sound fun at all? Uh Uh-uh. But victory and triumph sound amazing. See, if you're going to be passionate, I think you should be passionate about the most important things, which are the results. I think if you're a 100% kind of person, which most passionate people are, man, I want to put 100%, I'm a 100% kind of person, which is fantastic. You need to get around, by the way, people who are 100% kind of people. I could say I'm a 100% kind of person to all my friends that were running at 30, 40%, and I was running at 50%, and it made me seem awesome. But when you get around people who are really running 100%, man, I, it will challenge you. And if you don't have people like that who challenge you, I don't think you're living to your full potential. And if you want to be a 100% kind of person, be 100% focused on the results. What are you accomplishing? And I think if you create an extra fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year, let me ask you a question. If you had an ongoing fifty, sixty, seventy grand a year coming in, could you do things that you are more passionate about? Could you do things that you could really put yourself into? Because I know you want to put 100% into something, but if you're spending 40, 50 hours a week worrying about a paycheck, you're not putting 100% into Jack because you can't afford to because all of your decisions are being revolved around money. All of my decisions were revolved around money. 95% of my life was taken up by chasing a dollar bill. And I think if you want to create 40, if you want to create an extra 50 to $70,000 a year, and you want to take a small window of time to do that and build something for yourself, we were able to accomplish that in 18 months. And because we did that, we were able to spend the rest of our twenties being passionate about the things that we want to. We're able to put a hundred percent of our, our effort and our time and our heart into the people and the things that we cared about. Listen, here's what this world needs. Are you ready? This world needs you to win at the highest level. That's what it needs. It doesn't need more people building a business. It doesn't need need more people pursuing degrees. It needs more people that are living at the highest level that they can. And if creating some residual income, some ongoing income, can help you be the best person you can be, I think you need to see that as part of that drudgery, part of the struggle, part of the things that you just need to do to get it over with so you can focus on the things that are important. Because no one else has the same combination of people that they care about. And no one's going to love your mom like you love her. And no one's going to care about your kids like you care about them. No one's got the same vision for the future and cares about the organizations you care about. No one has the same talents and abilities that you bring to the table. No one has those combinations of things that you have. So every time that you spend, every day that you are not living at your highest level, I think you're doing the world a disservice. There's no passion to be found in living a life that's less than what you're capable of living. Go pursue what you need to, to create enough financial stability, not because money matters, but because you matter, because your future matters. And when you learn to live at the highest level, when you surround yourself with people who really have your back, when you have an opportunity that can let you unleash and let you start to be everything that you've got, I can't wait to see you how you live. I can't wait to see the effect you change in the world. How about this? How about you change your world? I'll change my world. These guys will change their world. We'll change the world together. I wish you all the best in every endeavor that you have. I cannot wait to see you live at the highest level, and we look forward to seeing you at the top. God bless you.